So he's going to be unconscious within two seconds of us getting him out if he's still alive. And then we've got to carry him down all of these stairs and we are going to run out of air. A high rise fire with 12 fire engines going to it. This is a once in a lifetime incident. How do I keep myself alive and save somebody else's? And this is now a 20 pump fire. We're probably not going to come out of this. And the first thing I remember when we got to the 15th floor is the heat. That floor level is 550 degree. That building was burning from the outside in and the inside out. It's just got a bit worse. It just got a bit worse. It just got a bit worse. It just got a bit worse to the point where you're like, I'm gonna f die. Suddenly it was really, really silent. And then right on cue, my emergency whistle goes off. This is it, I'm gonna die. Things had affected me, but I hadn't realized it. I became aggressive towards my son. He was petrified of me. What I had become was the one person I hated most in the world. And the reality is, there isn't a single firefighter that attended Grenfell Tower that made any decision other than one to try and save somebody at great potential risk to their own lives. Welcome to the debrief this week. I have a fireman on, or former fire, former fireman, isn't it? Former. Former fireman, that's right. Anyway, Ricky, no, here we go. What yeah. I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to do what I do with all my guests. I'm going to take you back to your childhood, and then we'll just we'll just build it because I want to know all about you. All right. Sure. So, so where, where are you from? Um, well, my dad was in the army, so I kind of moved around a bit. Oh, who was he with? Start. He was in the Remi. Oh, was he? Okay. Yeah, he was in the Remi. So he uh, he met my mum fairly young. Um, then got posted to. Uh, Germany. Oh wow, yeah. Um, Drinking most in that one. Munster, yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's where I picked <laughs> up all his bad habits. So <laughs> he got out, got out to Munster and then realised he missed me mum. So he proposed over the phone because um, they could only get quarters if they were married. Right, okay. And then um, they let him have some leave. He flew back to um, South Norwood is where they're all from, South Norwood, Hearn Hill. Yeah. Um, and got married, flew out to Germany. My older brother was born out there in Munster. Um, and a year later, we was posted to Northern Ireland. So I was born in Ballymena. Where, whereabouts? Ballymena. Uh, Ballymena. That, that oh, yeah, right, okay. yeah, so we're in Ballymena. So um, yeah, I was born there, and then a year after that, we were uh, reposted to Cyprus and went out to I think it was Limassol. That's a touch, isn't it? Yeah, oh well, mate, it's lovely. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I never had none of those sunshine posters. <laughs> yeah, not I, one. Well, I know a little bit about not you. One. Yeah, I was going to say you, you didn't have the best ones. Did Northern you? Ireland, Northern Ireland, no <laughs> Northern Ireland, and then yeah. fucking special forces. Yeah, yeah, that yeah, was yeah, it. Terrible. Brutal. Yeah, yeah cheers. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so you, you 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 lived out there. Did you do your schooling out there? Didn't you? No, no. So, um, my family broke up fairly early. My mum um had a miscarriage um when I was about I guess about four. Just nearly five. Okay. And um, she didn't cope very well with it, being so far away from friends and family. Although she loved the army life, she loved the camaraderie that existed. And yeah. you know, all the, the wives and the girlfriends would be together and the husbands. And it's such a social place. Yeah, she yeah, absolutely yeah. loved it. But suddenly when, when a trauma creeps in like that, she suddenly felt very isolated from everybody. So um, her and my dad had, had some fallings out. And then she said, look, I need to go back home. So she left my dad. Um, so my poor old dad was stranded out in in Cyprus. Um, did she, you go with mother? Took, did yeah, you? she took me and my older brother okay. with her. And at this point, she was re-pregnant again. Um, so she was pregnant with uh, a fourth pregnancy, but um, who, what turned out to be my little brother Daniel. Yeah. Um, so she then um, flew back to England. My dad then had to um, sort himself out out in Cyprus. Managed to buy himself out of the army. Um, I think he'd done like five years or something. I'm not sure. Okay. I, I can't remember how, how how early you can do it, but he managed to buy himself it's out. It's after three, I think. Anytime right, after okay, three, fine, you yeah. Put your cash in, yeah. So he, he did that and then flew back to England to try and sort of work stuff out and being young and both being a bit shit at working stuff out, um, it didn't work out. Okay. Um, that then sort of turned into a bit of toing and froing for a little while. Um, and then. Where my, was you living there? So my mum moved back to, we were in a place called New Addington at this point, New Addington and, and Shirley, two, two different um, sort of council estates. Right. Both properly rough. Yeah. You know, shit schools, um, <laughs> shit people, generally speaking. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah um, cer certainly at that time. And it was at that time my mum then met my, uh, who became my stepdad. Now he was introduced, it's a weird old introduction, but he was introduced by my uncle, but on my dad's side. So it was my dad's, my dad's sister 
Right, okay, got you. It was her husband. Right, uh, well, this that is knew... not the Jerry Springer show, I'll tell no. you that, right? Yeah, right, yeah. I'm trying to I'm trying to keep it simple. So he he introduced my stepdad through the Masons to my right, mum. Okay. They wow. hit it off. Um and then yeah, they, they ended up getting married. He was a CID in a British transport police. Okay. Um but is that where the Masonic thing come from, the old hands? Yeah, all that's all that weird, all that weird stuff, <laughs> mate. And, uh, legs up that's that. it, exactly, yeah. <laughs> and uh, and a little bit like your your childhood, I guess, and I don't know to what extent, but, um, you know, he became very violent very quickly. Yeah. Um, he wasn't a particularly um, good stepfather by no. any stretch of the imagination. Did I he d- hand it out to you as well? Did he, yeah, did, he did. He did. Some... Yeah, yeah. It, it, it wasn't so much the, the extent of things, really. It was more... It was more about what what they were given for, you know. You you. I was a kid. I yeah. was a young kid. You know. You are a bit noisy when you're a kid. Yeah. But I wasn't rude. I weren't. I weren't impolite. I wasn't yeah, running yeah, around yeah, swearing yeah. and yeah, breaking you want, shit. You want to wrong and he was like, yeah. I was a good. Stuff. I was a good kid. I was doing well at school. I was behaving myself. But any little thing he did wrong, he had. He, as an example, he had a pair of slippers and he'd write my name on the bottom of one and my brother's name on the bottom of the other. Really. And then he'd go right, go and get your slipper. And you had to go up and search for his fucking wardrobe, bottom all the shoes and bottom all the wardrobe to find the correct slipper to bring it down to him to get the clout, so he could then beat you with it. So all the while you're looking, you're he's making you look for something that's going to hurt you. Yeah, yeah. Do you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. It's and, a psychological thing. Yeah, somewhere in there, yeah, that's, exactly. That's horrible. Yeah, you know, yeah. and and sometimes he'd do things like he'd, he'd give us a choice of punishment. So it'd be like a wooden spoon, a slipper, or a, a, a spoon of mustard, English mustard. And yeah, that, and, that almost sounds like he's getting more out of it than, than uh, what you know what I mean. Like, why are you doing that? What's the mustard? Yeah, about, what's, you know what's what the point of it? What, what's yeah. the, what's it teaching me? Yeah, You're not yeah, teaching yeah. me anything. Nah. And to be honest, like I said, you know, these were for things like he'd ask us to keep the noise down, and me and my brother would be sword fighting. Do you remember them old plastic swords yeah, we used yeah, to get yeah. in a little sheath? <laughs> We'd have <laughs> one of them. Bend, they never yeah, go back that's to it. Them. Yeah, you'd see it snap <laughs> at the hilt, wouldn't it? And it's just like flopping around, and you end up fighting with the sheath, wouldn't you? So we had we we were a poor family. We didn't have much. So generally, one of us would have the sword, and the other one would have a sheath, and the game would be see how quickly you can fuck the sword up, yeah, so yeah, he can't yeah, fight yeah, back, yeah. and you can just eat your brother with a sheath because he can't. He's got nothing to fight with. <laughs> but one day we we're, we're messing about with these swords, and we're we're fighting with these. And I think he must have turned around and, and he's watching, trying to watch a Formula One or something on a Sunday afternoon. And he's turned around and told us to be quiet. So, you know, you go quiet for about 35 seconds, don't you, before yeah. you start <laughs> sword so fighting realize, again. Hang on, I've, still, hang on, I've still got it. Right? <laughs> and you're sort of, you know, you go, shut up, no, don't hit me. No, you don't hit me. And then you poke and then, and then and you get going <laughs> it's again, on. don't you? It's on. Suddenly, one, one of us had like hit the, hit the lampshade. Just glancing tap, nothing broke. Yeah. But it weren't even swinging. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And he's just got up and he's come storming in and because it was me with a sheaf, he's grabbed me by my clothes and he's slammed me up against the corner of the wall and the ceiling in the front room and he is absolutely screaming. Head like the right, right beat. Yeah, man, gone, mate. The, the mate. So, I can still like, remember his, <laughs> that's it, exactly. I still remember his <laughs> spit it in me in the face. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, and, and the, the thing that I remember the most, it isn't, like I said, it, it isn't really the things that happened, it's how they made you feel. So I ended up just feeling fucking petrified. Yeah. Anytime I'd hear the, the lock in the front nice door go. That's not nice as a kid. You're, 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 you're at home. You're supposed yeah. to feel safe. Yeah. Do you know what I, I mean? I used to hide. When my, when my doctor made it, I used to hide. Literally, yeah. I'd, I'd go somewhere or, or I'd go and sit in a bush across the road from my house. That's it. Yeah. Do you yeah, know what I mean? I'd, I'd hang around at school. Like, what kid does that? I'm hanging around at school yeah. for fucking an hour. <laughs> no, no. It's fucking driving rain and winter and, <laughs> and I'm hanging about like trying to collect conkers or something. Like, what you got them for? So I don't have to fucking go home. That's yeah. why. Like, do you know what I mean? And you get home and you get beaten for being late anyway. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. It yeah. was, yeah, it was just shit. And, so you haven't um, got great memories of being a kid then? Do you know what? It's a real mixed bag, to be honest, because... And I always make a point. You of, can normally of, pluck something good out of it, can't you? Always, yeah. always. And and I'll tell you one thing that I, I was never sure of in, from one person or another, which was love. Yeah. My mum loved me to pieces. And yeah. and me and my mum have spoken about my stepdad, you know, quite a few times over the years now since I've been become an still, adult. Is he still about? No. They, they, he ended up cheating on her and they got divorced. And, you know, he was just a... He's just an arsehole. Do you know what I mean? That's even a person, right? Yeah, I know. Or you, 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 that's that's, that's oh. what I mean. She goes through all of she, Because she's in a that real shit place. That must clown your mum a little bit as well. She must think, you know, I love you, son, and I've absolutely turned him over here. It's, it's, it, it, must, it must have been horrible. Well, yeah. I know it was. We've spoken about it. But um, I think it's really important. Um, I, I've had to let my mum know that I understand where she was coming from. I understand what she was trying to do. We were in a real shitty area in a yeah. council flat with zero prospects. He's come along and 
from in her mind, I guess, starts out with, well, he's not perfect. I'm not comfortable with how he's disciplining me kids, but we have just he's moved put, house. He's, put he's put the, the table, food on the he's, table. He's up, We're in a better area. Yeah. He's, the kids are going to a better school. Yeah, we've got a better... Yeah, and, yeah, and it's a balancing act, isn't it? It's a, you're, you're weighing up. Well, is it better that they get a few beatings as long as they're not getting bones broken and shit? Yeah. But they've actually got a chance of a future. Or is it better that we kick him out, live off state benefits... And they're just going to hang around with no one but arseholes their whole life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, yeah, yeah. Do you yeah, know what I mean? Can, I can see, yeah. No, it's I, it's I a horrible... You. What were you like at school? Oh, what was I like at school? Um, I was... I was... <laughs> I was far too chatty. I'm, I'm fairly switched on. I'm, I'm lucky that I've, I've always been naturally quite a bright kid. Yeah. I've always asked questions um, and I enjoy learning. Yeah. So I would be at school and I would learn. But if I found the lesson easy... I would end up being disruptive because I've already got the information. Yeah, yeah. So now yeah, I'm making yeah, yeah. jokes. So now, yeah, like yeah, distracting yeah, yeah, people. Yeah, yeah, and then other yeah. people don't learn. So I'd get in the shit for that all the time. You know, yeah. all my school reports would say, very intelligent, very capable, doesn't listen enough, talks too much, disruptive. Yeah, yeah. Pretty yeah, much yeah, yeah. throughout. Did, did school. you get any qualifications and that sort of stuff, did you? Yeah, so I I did my GCSEs. Um well, I mean, I I had a staggered sort of a staggered sort of schooling with because of stuff at home. I ended up moving to um, London. My dad took my stepdad to court okay. for um, uh, well, a child abuse, effectively. Um, oh, wow, okay. Um, and we moved to London. So I'd, I at that point I was twelve years old. I was in a grammar school in Kent, a, a very posh, very white grammar school in Kent. Yeah. Um, and then I moved to London, and my dad had to get us in a school, and I went to Ernest Bevin in in Tooting Beck. So I very quickly I'd gone from a. a I think my brother went there. I'm right, sure my it, brother went there. Yeah. Well, if if he did, I hope he's done all right for himself. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you can't right, fit him, mate. Right. I had it. Is it still open? Because I'm sure yeah. my, I'm sure one of my little nieces, Jack, went there as well, and he, he had a terrible time because he, he got bullied properly. Yeah, there, like, it was I mean? a, it was a it was a brutal school. Yeah. It was a brutal school. I mean, I went from being a, a posh white kid in a posh white school to being a posh white kid in an inner London, almost completely black school. Where you know I'm yeah. rocking up, going, "Hello, how are you? My <laughs> name's Ricky," and they and they're going, up, "Shut fam? up, bro! Who are you talking to? <laughs> yeah, fam. Move, fam! Don't don't watch me." And and I'm like, I don't know what's going on here. Do you know this what I mean? Kid active. Yeah, and and they were telling me I'm speaking funny, and I'm like, I think you'll find it's you that speaks funny. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, do you know what I mean? Straight away, punch in the face. Oh shit! It was it was brutal, but I you know I I, I found my way. You know. You, it's sink or swim, isn't it? Yeah. In these situations, you yeah. find you find a way. I I found a way of ingratiating myself into people by sort of chameleon and being a chameleon a, a yeah. little bit. You know, not changing who I am as a person, but working out how I fit into my environment. Yeah, and a lot of that I did through humour. I was I was quite sharp, so I, I would make jokes and make people laugh, and people liked me. So I, I got through school all right then, and done my GCSEs, got my five A to C's in maths, English, science. Um, and then stayed on to start doing A levels. So I okay. was doing doing maths, physics, and English A levels. Um, stayed for two thirds of the first year, and then my older brother by this point was coming home in a suit because he had a job because he'd left school because he yeah. was thick as shit. And he's left school and he's coming home in a, in a suit, you know, in new trainers and all these things. Yeah, so you got that thick now. You got that thick now. You got a bit of money well, on Exactly. It. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm and I'm and I'm there going, hang on, I think one of us has got this wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so I, yeah, I've said to my dad, "Oh, dad, I, you know, I, I don't know if I want to go to uni after my A levels because I'm testing out the water. Because if I say I want to drop out A levels, you might go, you fucking not stay yeah, at school.' Yeah, 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 yeah. So I've said, oh, I, I don't know if I want to do my, you know, I do don't know uni. Where this is going, like. Yeah, and he was like, well, if, well, if you're not going to go to uni, what's the point in doing A levels? I mean, good point. Yeah, dad. nice one. <laughs> yeah, like, like, pop I'll get a job. <laughs> 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 so that's it. So my first job from school was working for a bailiff company. Wow. Okay. So, good. Just doing knocking doors and um, no. Well, I was in the office, okay. um, so I was just doing you know uploading like data data input basically sort of shit. And but very quickly, it was a very unprofessional company. So within a few weeks, someone someone else that worked there had handed me a phone and said, "Why don't you start taking calls?" And I'm like, "Because I got no legal training." <laughs> and they're like, <laughs> "No, nah, you don't need doing. it. Just listen to what we say." And so that was it. So then I was on on calls to debtors and then um, went out as a bailiff. Um, not long after that. Which, to be honest with you, I was a soul-sucking, soul-destroying, 
miserable job. It's just misery job. all the time. It's just misery. Oh, it's, it's, just just, it's either misery for you or misery for them, isn't it? Or misery yeah. for both of you. And misery all around. It's just, it is. It's just misery all around. Because <laughs> if you're good at a job, you're an arsehole. And if you're bad at a job, if you're a bad, bad at a job, you're, you're, yeah. no one else fucking likes you anymore for it. They're just happy they got rid of you. They think you're a mug because they've mugged you off and they, they got away with not paying something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You get back like, to the lose. office and the office are going, what the fuck are you doing? Why have you collected no money? <laughs> fuck, you know, you're shit. <laughs> So yeah, I didn't last, didn't really last that long now. I didn't enjoy it. I stayed as long as I had to because I've, I've always had a good work ethic. And for me, it's like I'm not going to leave somewhere until I've got yeah, somewhere I've else all, to I've go. Yeah, I've always said that. I'll say that to young young people now. Don't don't wash, don't get rid of the old until you got the new in. Like, That's you know it, I mean? exactly. You've got, you got, yeah. you got to bridge that gap, haven't you? Do you know what I mean? 100, Otherwise, hundred percent. You sink into no man's land and you just drift away from everybody. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? You've had it then. That's it. And and also, I just think if 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 when it gets difficult, your first port of call is I'm going to bail. Yeah, you're right. And then I'll worry about it after. Then then what, all you're teaching yourself is when things get hard... Run away. Run away. Yeah. And what's the fucking point in that? Where, 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 how how do you get anywhere in life <laughs> yeah. if you're doing that? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So I stuck it out for as long as I needed to while I was applying for the fire brigade. So what, 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 what the fire brought brigade. the fire brigade thing on? Why, why did you suddenly think, I'll tell you what, I'll, do, I'll be a fireman? I'll be honest with you, it, it's something I always wanted to do when I was a kid. Like when I was, My mum remembers as far back as me being three years old, and, and, and this sums my mum up beautifully. I said to her when I was around three, I want to be a firefighter when I grow up. I would have said fireman back then. Yeah. I want to be a fireman when I grow up. And my mum said, oh, lovely, darling, you do that. And then she told me years later, she remembers thinking, you ain't going to be a fucking firefighter. you got no chance. <laughs> you know, because she'd come from a world of limitations where she was told what you know she can what? and I can't think, do. I think people do set those limitations. I remember my yeah. nipper in his comprehensive school and, 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 and they had this like career meeting. And one of them turned around and said, you could be a driver. And my mum come up, I said, you could be driven. How about yeah. that? And now he is. He's an officer, he's a captain and there he's a go. driver. Do you know what yeah. I mean? You could be a driver. No, no, no. Why are you smashing that kid up? Do you yeah. know what I mean? He might well be a driver, and there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. But yeah. why not just give him the option to say, and you could be as high as you can get, son? You it know it what reminds I mean? me of the Mickey Flanagan sketch where he talks about um, he, he's taking the mick out of being at school and how everyone at school at his school was thick as shit. And he said, and rem remembers one lad day, this lad put his hand up and went, I think I want to be a van driver. And Mickey Flanagan goes, We all laughed, we all mocked him, we went, this school is designed to create the people that carry stuff to the van, <laughs> not that drive the van. <laughs> like, yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's that sort of thing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, exactly what it is, yeah. So you, you, you've, your aspirations of being a fireman were sort of like burning away, shall we say? Yeah, yeah, like, exactly oh, that. That's a pun yeah, in there. yeah. Yeah, they, they were. And, and I guess as, I, as you get older, you know, sometimes you just lose track of what you want to do a little bit, don't you? You, yeah. you sort of, I got into that mode where I was just doing what was falling in front of me. So, oh, this comes up, I'll do that. And you want the dough all the time, don't you? Yeah, that's it. And it was only, yeah, exactly. And, and it was only when that job, um, the bailiff sort of fell apart. I worked at Toys R Us for a brief spell in there as well, yeah. which I'll be honest with you, is one of the best fucking jobs yeah. I've ever had. That place <laughs> was amazing, like that. Did mate. You get the doorway, flying the drones. Oh, my you God. The well, it's, it's, sadly, it was way before drones. <laughs> we had micro scooters. That was about as good as it got for us. But we had a right laugh there, I'll tell you. But, um, but yeah, you know, and, and, and then when you realise uh, right, you, you're looking into the future and you don't see one, you're like, right, yeah. what the fuck am I going to do with my life? And I'll be honest with you, it was a choice for me at that point between the, the Royal Marines and the, um, okay. and the fire service. The fire service. And I went down to the Royal Marines down at Limps and I'd done my PRMC down there. And I was, I'll be honest with you, I was just a bit shit. I hadn't trained physically enough um, before I went down there and I hadn't built any kind of real resilience i guess so that when things got hard i would i would push through i was i was at that age i was still only about 18 i guess or 19 or something like that and i was at the age where if i if i can't see the end i can't keep going yeah yeah, do you know yeah, what yeah I mean? i'll get that yeah do, yeah do you know what i mean yeah. and so on on their like what's it my three mile run or mile and a half run on a pyramid yeah, so i can't what it is now but it's basically six minute mile pace yeah i was running nine minute miles do you know what i mean i was <laughs> i was way off the <laughs> pace so there, yeah so do you know what i mean so they've stuck <laughs> me down there and i'm keeping up for about the first half mile and then i'm like <gasps> yeah. you know like i'm having an asthma attack and if i even even now at the age of 42 if i went down there now and had to do it i know i could because yeah. I've built that resilience. I know, I know it's only a mile and a half. Yeah. I fucking do, I'll just do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Whereas at that age, up. at that age, no, it's too hard. I yeah. won't, I won't do it. So that didn't work out. And then I'd already applied for the fire service at that point. And then that came through, you know, it's, um, yeah. And then, so how long was your training to become a fireman? Oh, worryingly short. 
Wow, okay. Yeah, worryingly short. Four months back then it was. I think it's down to about three months now. Really? So it's it's literally sort of like get you get you through, get you the basics, get teach you the fire triangle and all that. Pre- sort pretty of much, stuff. mate. It's ba- it's basically we need to teach you how not to kill yourself or someone else, and then the rest of the job you're going to learn when you get you're there. Because the, the shouts in the fire brigade are just completely off the scale, varied, aren't they? In fact, people yep. have said to me before, if you get if you have a row around your house, call the fire brigade because yeah. you get six <laughs> member of axes turn up. That's right, it. You know what I mean? Well, this is the, the way I describe the job to people is if if there's a crime, you call the police. If there's a medical emergency, it's the ambulance. Or these days, also sometimes the fire service. Yeah. But absolutely anything else is the fire service. Yeah. So the the scope of work we we undertake is is we I used to undertake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah is yeah, huge. Yeah, yeah. You know, like it's absolutely massive. It's anything from floodings, a kid with a finger stuck. Have you ever stuck done a cat up a tree? Um, I haven't done a cat. That's the t- typical I, one of the cat up a tree. I, I, yeah, I, I'll be honest with you. What annoys me about the the people that because we do go out and do that, but I I get irritated at the people that call us out. How, how many cat skeletons have you ever seen in a fucking tree? <laughs> how many? Yeah. Do you, you know, know what I mean? Happens. They just come down, don't they? Yeah. Why are we going out to that? It's fucking useless. Yeah. A waste of my time. Oh, yeah, how many cats have broken legs? Yeah, just... Oh, yeah, done Do it you know what I mean? Tree, mate. Yeah. The amount of times you'll pitch a ladder, get up there, and a fucking cat will just jump out, and you're like... <laughs> waste of time. So, first call-out. Do you remember your first ever call-out? Yeah, I do, yeah. Um... The, the first night shift, so I joined right at the end of my shift, so you do two days, two nights, and you have four days off. My first night posted at station was my our watch's last night shift. So I was doing the one night shift and then going <laughs> home for four days, yeah. which I thought, perfect. It will give me a chance to meet people, and then I've got a bit of space again before I have to go back, yeah. and I can work it all out, you know. We had a car fire that night, and it was um, I was stationed at Hillenden out in Uxbridge, and... Um, the the car had been stolen, had its plates removed, torched the car. So we've gone out like two o'clock in the morning or whatever. I'm there with BA with my head stuck in this car, putting out the fires, fucking hot, carnage everywhere, you know, and my adrenaline's pumping because it's yeah. the first first shout I've ever had. I've already smashed my leg up on the pole coming down the pole in the station because <laughs> I didn't know how to use it properly. Yeah. Just launched myself at it. Seat in the van. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. It's all going wrong. Do you know what I mean? But I put this put fire out. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. I've got a tunic on my legs. I've got fucking boots hanging down by my ears. And what's going on? But yeah, we, we, we got there and I put the fire out and then we had to wait for the police. And I remember sitting down on the pavement next to this burnt out car in this alleyway. You know, it ain't a romantic setting. And I remember it was it was in the summer, like June time, and I, and I remember seeing the sun start coming up, and then his car was still sort of smouldering away a bit, and I smelt a smoke, and I, it's the most manly I've ever fucking felt in my life. Do you know what I mean? I was like, <laughs> oh, I am a geezer. I oh, love this. I've arrived. Oh my I've god, arrived. I'm a fucking hero. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. That's how I felt, and and obviously very quickly you realise that's the mundane, boring. Parts of the job, you know what yeah. I mean? Because you get twenty car fires in in a couple of months, you know. And very well, quickly, do you remember becomes... the first time there was a human element involved as well? Yeah, I do. That was <laughs> that was another. Um, oh, so it was a masonette, first floor masonette in yeah. Uxbridge, and uh, we got called out. And, and on the way to a job, you'll get further information over the radio. So yeah. on this occasion, it was this is now multiple calls, persons reported fire, which means loads of people have phoned it in, which means you've ninety nine percent you've got something. Yeah. And it also means persons reported. So someone somewhere has said there are people in there. So at that point, okay. the driver puts his foot down a little bit more. Yeah. You get there a bit quicker. And we're already like getting our BA sets on as we're arriving. And I was I was riding BA. So I'm going to be one of the people that, that goes in it first. Goes in, yeah. So me and this other firefighter have gone in. Um, as, as we've arrived, sorry, the front door is ablaze. Someone's petrol bombed the front of the house. So the front door's on fire. There's fire going up the stairs. And there's this woman and her daughter, both the size of small fucking houses, like hanging out the front window. And I'm thinking, first thing I'm thinking is, I've got to fucking carry this bird out. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, I'm about, I'm about 11 stone went through at this point. And I'm like, fucking hell. Well, we, I, I'm, on a ladder. Honestly, I'm not even joking. I thought maybe I can, if we put the fire out on the stairs, I might just be able to like push her down a bit or something. Like, I'm like. <laughs> anyway, we get up to the top of the step. We've sm- smashed the door in there. there. There's a crew there already there, like putting a fire out. And we've gone upstairs, and I've grabbed this woman and um, <laughs> the the, the mum. I've grabbed her. I've got in first, and I've just passed her to the other guy. <laughs> like, Go on, mate. 
<laughs> like I'm in charge. And he's, he must have been thinking, you prick. You absolute. I've got the slightly lumpy 12-year-old now, and I'm, I've, so I've got over. Anyway, we've we've um, sort of half-dragged, sort of half-walked <laughs> them down the stairs. The fire's out, and we've got them out, and they're coughing and spluttering, and we've handed them over. And then this woman starts shouting, they're still in there, they're still in there, my babies, they're in there. And my, I, my, I remember my heart just dropping, thinking, shit. Next thing you know, go, governor's come over, gone, Rick, Rick, there's four of them in the front room, in the front room. And I thought, fucking four. Bombed it up the stairs, I've gone back in, and I remember searching this front room like my life depended on it. You're supposed to do, like, sweeping the wall and taking a step forward and sweeping with your foot and all this stuff. Yeah. Oh, I was just fucking carnage, throwing yeah, shit yeah, everywhere, yeah, opening up. drawers. Where's this woman going to have put four babies? Do you know what I mean? Like, we had to knock this cage across the room, another one, the TV's come down, fucking all this shit. As time's going on, it's, you know, we're talking seconds, but it feels like fucking hours when you're yeah. looking for people and you can't find them. And I've gone running. Because people do in fires end up in some bizarre hide. places. Weird. Don't they? Do you know and people I mean? do weird things. Yeah. People fucking hide a newborn baby in a drawer in the hope that the smoke won't get in if they think they're going to die. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. So anyway, I can't find these fucking four babies. So I've gone tearing down the stairs again. I'm shouting, grabbing my governor's arm. Gov, gov, gov. He's like, what? He went, where are the birds? I went, what? He went, the birds. I said, babies. He went, what fucking babies? Birds. She's screaming, my babies. <laughs> He's gone, there's four of them. There's fucking four birds in two cages. That I've just launched across the front room looking for these babies. So I'm like, oh, I think I might know where they are, Gov. So I've gone back upstairs. I found these two dented cages. I've come back downstairs. I'm like, I've got them. These are two dead birds at the bottom of each cage. <laughs> oh, I've got them. <laughs> the, lo the local newspaper printed the story and they said, um, hero firefighters re-entered the property to try and save four birds which unfortunately later died of smoke inhalation at the vets. Oh, mate, that's a flashman moment. Oh, that, mate, that's like a I problem. was like, <laughs> they died of concussion, <laughs> 100%. <laughs> they smashed their heads in. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that was my first proper rescue. Yeah. So, you must have seen a lot, have you? Car crashes. Does, did anything phase you? I'm going to be honest. It, over the, over the, the space of time... Um, up until 2017, which no doubt we'll come on to talk about, but yeah. up until then, things had affected me, but I hadn't realised it. Okay. And and I don't know if you'll you'll you've experienced this or not, but I think when when things like PTSD or or any kind of trauma happen continuously, I think it 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 is possible that you slowly change. Do you know what I mean? I'd become a lot less tolerant of people's shit. Someone goes, oh, "I've had a hard day," and I'm like, "Have you?" What's yeah, happened? Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, the fucking bag. Me, me shopping bag split and the fucking milk went everywhere. Oh, that's a hard day, is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah, fucking yeah. pick it up. You, Ooh, got some milk. Do you know what I mean? You absolute <laughs> melt. And I became really intolerant of people's shit. Like, oh, yeah. me, me boyfriend's left me. Well, were you an arsehole? Was he an arsehole? Well, he was an arsehole. Yeah, well, then don't fucking worry about it. Let's yeah. move on. Yeah, 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 do, you know, yeah. do you know what I mean? You you lose that ability do, to be I empathetic. Because I'm like that. I have, right. been, I have been like that. Certainly. Yeah. And, and what that means is you stop functioning in normal society. You then only function within your group of people, which then means you become indoctrinated in the environment you're in. So for you, that would have been the military special forces. Yeah. For me, that was the fire service. Yeah. When I was with my fire brigade buddies, I know that I can pretty much say what I want, make any kind of inappropriate joke, be exactly how I want, be be you know uncompassionate, be be just a bit of an arsehole. Almost arsehol. make a joke out of things and, to get and, over the lump. Yeah, it? yeah, that's it. And, and everyone's fine with that. But when you're sitting around a dinner table... And you forget yourself and make a joke, you know, any any kind of highly inappropriate joke at yeah. a dinner table. Um, Goes down like a fart on a Oh, suit, my God, doesn't it? <laughs> and then people look at you going, what's wrong with you? And you're like, what's wrong with Nothing's fucking wrong with me. It was a joke. <laughs> yeah. But you don't realise. How realize, can you joke about yeah, things? Yeah. Right. But you don't realise all these things have chipped away at you and, yeah. they're, and they're slowly changing you. And then... I liken it to a jug. I say we, we as people, we're like jugs. And, and if you imagine um, water going pour, being poured into that jug, filling it up from a tap, that's trauma. And every now and then, if you don't want that jug to overflow, you've got to tilt it a bit, tip a bit of that yeah. water out. That's counselling or that's talking or that's opening up to whoever it is, yeah. your colleagues. It don't, you know, don't have to be in a clinical environment. But if you don't tilt that jug, then that water fills up to the top and then it overflows. And that comes out as violence or aggression or, or a drink, breakdown, or tears, or, yeah, drink, yeah, yeah, yeah. drugs. Do you know what I mean? All of these things. 
But when you don't realise that that's what's going on, I, I've always had natural coping mechanisms where I was doing just enough for that jug not to overflow. Just I enough. think you do that, and I, I certainly did for a while in the regiment, where you where you're doing that purely because you want to keep where you are. Yeah, because you you I always had this feeling inside of me: if you stick your hand up now, Phil, you're go, you're going back to you're going back to the PWRR. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Or you're you know that's not going to happen for you because you yeah. know people are going to you know almost people are like what, what's he doing? Do you know yeah, what I mean? yeah, and and it's difficult as well, I think, because <laughs> you there's always that stigma, particularly with men, when we're talking about mental health, to have a label. Do you know what yeah. I mean? If you see yourself as resilient, you see yourself as tough, you know, I'm I'm a firefighter, I, I go to the gym, I keep myself in shape, I box, you know, I'm 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 a bit of a lad, like I've, and, all, I've, and, all, I've got, and all of a sudden you go I've got poor mental health, I'm yeah. feeling sad. And people and people are be like, Oh, you, where the fuck's that come from? Like, oh Rick's broken. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And and you don't you don't want to be viewed that way. No. But the reality is you don't have a fucking choice because you get viewed that way. And the longer you leave it go, the worse the it's worse going to be it, when you the, do get viewed that way. So instead exactly. of sort of like going, that's not too bad, it's going to go, oh, my God, that's yeah. awful. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, no, you're right. Exactly. So let's let's fast forward you on. Let's take you let's take you to the to the, to the events of the, of the 17th. Uh, yeah, so um, 14th of June it was, 20, 2017. 14th, yeah, sorry, yeah. Um, Grenfell Tower Fire. Um, in a nutshell, we'd gone on, it was our first night shift of the two. So we'd gone on duty at 8 p.m., Normal night shift, everything's ticking over nicely. Um, much to the, the military's disgust, we have nice comfy beds that we get to sleep in on a night shift. <laughs> not a, not a, Do you get your boots <laughs> off as well? Not, yeah, well, you mate. I sleep, in, I sleep in my pants, mate. <laughs> I'm literally in my pants. But much like the military, we're also rapid deployment service. Yeah. You know, So I'll be asleep, well, that night particularly, I was asleep in my pants and the bells go down and within 60 seconds, you're dressed on the fire engine pulling yeah. out the station. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. There's no fucking about. What was unusual on this night is by the time I'd got down to our watch room, you've got like a, a, a print sheet that prints out and tells you all the details of what you're going to. Yeah. And by the time I'd got to the watch room, that was still printing, which has never happened in my career because normally it's like a couple of trucks are going, this is the address, this is the event, tear the sheet off, jump on the motor. Whereas this was still printing because there's loads of trucks going to it and there's loads of information. So I'm looking going, fucking hell, a high rise fire with 12 fire engines going to it. Jesus, that must be going. All right. So tear the sheet off, get on the truck, pull out the station. By the time we'd got to the main road, which is another 60 seconds. That's the A40. Is the A40 you was going down to get there? Um, that would have been that, yeah. But the yeah. main I'm in the main road in Clapham Junction. Oh, okay. I was at, stationed at Battersea Fire oh, Station right. at this okay. time. I was coming from the other one, you said the other side. Yeah, yeah no, yeah, yeah, no. Yeah. So oh, I'm, I'm at Battersea Fire Station at this time. And so we've actually pulled out onto Falcon Road. Um, and by the time we got there, another message came over from the radio saying, this is now a 20-pump fire, which means they've just requested... Uh, an additional eight fire engines on the 12 that we were included in 60 seconds later. And we're like, what the fuck has happened at this job in 60 seconds yeah. that they've decided they need another eight motors when when the 12 aren't even there yet? By the time, um, sorry, then we were driving down the road and um, another radio message came over. Now, there's a thing in the fire service called an FSG call, which is Fire Survival Guidance. What that basically means is if somebody, if you if you're trapped in a fire and you phone a fire brigade, you're on the phone to control and you say to them, um, there's a fire in my tower block, blah, blah, blah. And they say, are you affected? And if you go, yeah, i.e. you've got smoke coming under the door or you can feel heat or there's yeah. visible flames somewhere, they'll say to you, can you safely get out of where you are? So if you open your flat door and you're like, it's a fucking inferno the other side and loads of smoke's pissing into the flat now, you shut yeah. the door again, you go, no, I can't. They say, right, this is now a fire survival guidance call. They'll then give you advice so that you can, you know, put your wet sheets across the bottom of the door, stop yeah. smoking, grass, yeah. open a window, shout for it, go ground, somewhere all that, safe, all, all, all of that stuff. stuff. Yeah. And they will stay on the phone with you until you're either rescued or dead. That is that control member's job at that point. Now, the next radio message I heard, bearing in mind at control on that night, I think we had 13 members of staff on duty, which is normal. Yeah. The radio message I heard was there are 156 fire survival guidance calls in progress. So you know now, this is like, this is... People this, are dying. This ain't it, this, this is... Yeah, this is the mother call. This yeah, is like, that's this it. Is, that, this, this, is this is a, and I don't mean this in a good way, but this is a once in a lifetime incident. Yeah, you know, like the King's yeah, yeah, Cross yeah, yeah, fire, yeah, yeah, like yeah, yeah. you know, the, the, that's yeah, the what is train one, crash. Something yeah, like that. You know, it's something like down. that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So by the time we got there, we can see flames going up in a really weird burn burn pan from about the fourth floor up to the twenty fourth floor, and then back down about halfway to about the fifteenth. So almost like burning in a triangle shape. 
And I'm looking at that and I'm going, how the fuck's it burning like that? Because you'd expect on a high rise, a uh, high rise fire, a couple of windows have got fire in. That fire can jump directly above or across or sometimes even down, depending yeah. on wind direction and falling debris. But it's a block. It's yeah. a block of fire. This was just fucking haphazard, just spreading wherever it wanted. And we couldn't work it out. And obviously it came to light afterwards that that's because of the, the cladding. flammable cladding. Yeah, the cladding. Yeah. You know, it is basically causing a chimney effect up the outside of the building. It was all flammable and it's just setting light to everything. So very, very quickly, that building was burning from the outside in and the inside out. Wow. So you're chasing your tail as soon as you turn up. Just now, so when you get there and you, you see that, has your heart rate gone from sort of like ding, ding, ding to, to proper clatting away now? I'm going to be honest, it's kind of the other way around a little bit. It's on the way there, your heart rate's racing because you're like, I want to get there, there's adrenaline surging. Once you see, once you see what you've got to do, I, I can only speak for myself, but my mind then just goes, right, work mode. What do I need to do? Yeah. What are my duties? What equipment have I got? What training can I use? How do I keep myself alive and save somebody else's? And that is all I think about. Nothing else. There is no emotion involved. There's no, I'm um, um, shitting my pants at this point. That came later when things changed. Yeah, that's the glad to be alive club. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> right? it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's yeah. a similar sort of thing to, you know, getting pumped up to go on a job. Do you know what I mean? Then you're in the back of the chopper. You, you're coming off the chopper, but then you're into that mode where you're like, this needs to be done now. So that's yeah. All your rehearsals, all your orders, all your everything you know is employed on that. So yeah, I get that. I totally get yeah. that. But you must have had that one thing because look, all the stuff I've done, I've known I was getting into it to a point. Do you know what I mean? In Northern yeah. Ireland, you could know I didn't know I was going to get blown up, but you sort of like know that something could happen. You didn't know that it was going to be that extent when you left the when you left the job. When no, you left to and go on that and, job, and to you? be honest, because so that must have gone to you, boom. Yeah, it, it did. And, and I mean, the, things happened very, very quickly when we arrived that, that it sort of, you know, like builds on it. And it's like, it's just got a bit worse. It just got a bit worse. Just got a bit worse. Just got a bit worse to the point where you're like, I'm going to fucking die. Yeah. And at that point, obviously, it's shit your pants time. Yeah. But you're, you're in fight and flight mode, aren't you? So you're yeah, in, so well. You're, now your training's kicking in. Exactly. Yeah. But at, at, at that point, there's a definite level of emotion involved. So the first thing that I saw as I turned up was two girls who were unconscious, not breathing, with black soot coming out the nostrils, black soot out the corners of their mouths, on their backs, limp, lifeless, about 12 years old, around that age, being carried out by a couple of firefighters. And the third firefighter that followed them out looked at me dead in the eyes and went, be careful in there. No firefighter's ever said that to me at any incident ever. And I've had a few hairy incidents. Yeah. So that made me think, right, whatever has gone on in there for him is bad. Yeah. So I'm, I'm being switched on now. You know, this is a serious thing. I, I hasten to add as well that those two girls were revived outside and survived. Just, I always like to add that yeah, for no. people. Um, so we've gone up to our entry control point and the first thing I'm told, now... Is smoke, that a, pre, a pre-designated point? Do you, yeah. Is someone so, on the ground, is there a coordinator on the ground that yeah, goes, yeah. when they get here, they go in there, and when they get exactly, here, they go in there? Exactly okay. that, yeah. You'll have like a, a, a BA entry control officer, which will be the person that stands at the actual entry control point. Yeah. You'll have a board and you take a tally out of your, your um, ADSU and then you a bodyguard, they're called, and then you stick yeah, it so in the thing. Counted and, in, counted so out, you're counted in, counted out. It's all yeah. electronically linked, right? Yeah. Great. And then it tell, also tells them your air consumption, how hard you're working, and when your time a whistle is. So all of these sets have got a built-in whistle. That so says you need when, to get when, out now. When, yeah, when that whistle, so the protocols are when the whistle goes off, you're already out the building. If in, when you're in training, if you're not out the building when that whistle goes off, you fail that section of the course. Okay. It's that important. Yeah. So um, also, um, just to build into this, um, you never go into a fire floor without water, already tested and charged hose. Because smoke is effectively unburnt petrol. It's, it works the same as petrol. If you yeah. stick a lighter into a smoke layer, it'll ignite. You'll get pockets of flame because there's unburnt fuel in it. So if you go into an area where you can't cool those gases down, those gases at ceiling, temp- at ceiling height can be up to 1,000 degrees. And if a door then fails and embers hit that smoke layer, it can explode. It's called is that fire- like a flashover, is it? Um, it, it, a flashover is air, isn't it? A, a flashover is slightly different. A flashover is where everything reaches its auto ignition temperature and spontaneously bursts into flames. Yeah. This is more of an explosion of fuel, so it's called a fire gas explosion. Wow! And and that will that's a, pretty much an unsurvivable event if you're in it when it happens because you've got the shock waves of the explosion 
plus the rise in temperature from anything from you know 500 degrees where you are on the floor to in excess of a thousand at ceiling temperature. And it just, the whole room becomes a thousand degrees. You just melt. I think you cook a chicken at 200, don't you? So 200, <laughs> exactly. Right, that exactly. Is, that is bonkers it's, it's temperature, isn't it? So the first thing I was told when I got to entry control was, we can't give you any water. Um, here's a length of rolled hose that you're going to take with you. We need you to go to the 15th floor. There's a man on a fire survival guidance call who is going to be dead without you getting him out. So take a roller hose, take this door battering ram, take this branch, your two BA sets and your fire gear. Meant between myself and my colleague, we're carrying about 50 to 55 kilos of additional weight. And we're going through... What was the entry tool? Like a hooli bar or something like that? Was yeah, it's it? like a, a big yellow battering ram. Same on the police use. It's called yeah, an yeah, enforcer. Yeah. The enforcer. The enforcer. Oh, so enforcer. Had enfor yeah, we had an enforcer. They had done, they? I'm going to yeah. use enforcers. It's yeah. like 20 odd kilos, yeah. yeah. So we got an enforcer, a, a, roll, a length of rolled hose, which is 22 kilos. So that's 40 just on their own. By the time you throw your weighty fire your, gear, your eight, 18 on, kilo yeah. BA set each. You know, it's, it's a lot of additional weight. And we're told 15th floor, guy's going to die without you. We can't give you water, so you've got to go through four floors that are on fire, it, through flammable gases that could ignite at any moment. And when you get to the 15th floor, you've got to roll your hose out, plug it into a dry riser, which is like an outlet um, that's hopefully got water that coming to it. That might work. That might work, yeah. And then you can start cooling gases down if you have water. And I'm like, the first thing I thought is, we don't have enough air to get to the 15th floor and back out. With this kit, at yeah. that work rate, we don't have enough air. So the first thing I know is, we're probably not going to come out of this. And if we do, it's going to be by the seat of our pants. Mm. And then you just go, right, shit in my pants a little bit at this point. But again, it's that fight or flight. What do we do? Because we could have refused to go in. I mean, I don't, I can't think of a firefighter that ever would. Yeah. But from a legal perspective, from a, a you know job rule perspective, health and health and, do you know what I mean? <laughs> you're allowed to go, I don't have sufficient equipment to carry this out. I'm working outside of the role map, outside of health and safety legislation. Yeah. I don't feel comfortable doing that. Bear in mind, I've got a three-year-old kid at home that I'd like to see again at some point. Yeah. But I'm also acutely aware of the fact that there's 156 people on Still phone calls that are going to burn to death if we don't make some some effort and some headway into this. So you just go, as much as I'm sure you have many times in the past, you just go, well, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it and I'm going to do the best fucking job I can while I'm in there. Yeah. And if it goes bandy for me, at the very least, I want to have made a difference for someone else. Yeah. Or you could say, you, you know, you, you tried. You tried. did your best. Exactly that. Yeah. So we've started making our way up and, and things just got progressively worse. One thing after another went wrong. The middle of the hose spilled out and the hose got tangled. So now not only when we get to the 15th floor have we got to find water and hope it works, we've also got to untangle a hose. We um, realised that the refurbishment people that had put the emergency lighting in the stairwell that we're using had put it over the floor numbers. So we don't know what fucking floor we're on. So we've got to come off the protected stairwell onto a fire floor, search around in heat and smoke with the backs of our hands in thick leather gloves for a door number to try and work out what floor we're on. We had to do that twice. The first time we got lost on a landing because we couldn't find our way back because we weren't familiar with the layout of the building. Um, and then by the time we got to the 15th floor, we are absolutely blowing, you know, like... Yeah, I can imagine. I mean, that, that's, I mean the 15 floors, like this. Yeah. Is yeah, yeah. 15 floors, all that gear, smoke, fire, screaming, kicking. Yeah. Honking. Yeah, yeah, it was awful. And and the first thing I remember when we got to the fifteenth floor is the heat. So me and me and my, my friend Leon and my colleague that went in with, he, we've got down on our knees. And the first thing I can feel is through the um, cotton part of our gloves, the elasticated part, I can feel my wrists burning. Underneath my cotton flashed around the back of my neck and the bottoms of my ears, I can feel them start to burn. And I was like, it is fucking hot. What sort of temperature do you think? So I there? took a thermal imaging camera that we carried up with us and I took a temperature and at floor level it's 550 degrees Celsius. That's hotter than getting your oven. Yeah. Twice I don't as, think I could get my oven twice as hot, <laughs> Twice as hot as an oven in ski yeah. gear, effectively, is what you're, what you're doing. And I was like, right, we have not got long here if we can't cool this, this area down. And the way we would do that is with pulse spraying with, yeah. the, with the hose. You know, the water turns to steam, takes energy out the, out the heat. So we need water. That must almost boil as soon as it hits the, as it, it, hits the it does. It's instant boiling. And this yeah. is why you have to be careful with how much water you use. Because whilst your fire gear is heat reflective to a point, yeah. it's not um, water repellent. 
So if it gets wet, that heat transfers straight through your fibre yeah, yeah, directly yeah, yeah. onto you your skin. So you boil yourself. yourself. Basically, if you use too much water, you boil yourself. You get bad steam burns or, or you can kill yourself. So I've said to Leon, go and find a dry riser, take the end of the hose. I'm going to kneel down now and start untangling the hose from this end. So I'm lucky enough to have been part of the London Fire Brigade's rope rescue team for a lot of years. So I'm pretty handy with a rope, knots and all that shit. So I'm on my knees trying to block out the burning and trying to block out anything else that's going on around me. And I start to untangle this hose in the dark, without sight, like feeling, passing a hose through, feel a lump, pass the end back through again, pull a knot through. And as I'm doing this, I'm thinking, right, we're getting somewhere. We'll be all right. We'll be all right. And then I noticed Leon had gone off down, down the way there. And I, I noticed how fucking quiet it was. Suddenly it was really, really silent. You know when the people say like the calm before the storm? Yeah. I was like, it is deathly silent. Can't hear any screaming anymore. The radio in my ears failed. Can't hear a crackle of any fire because there's no direct flame on this landing. And it made me realize me and Leon were probably the two highest people up in that building at that time with 10 plus floors below us engulfed in flames. And I'm thinking, this is really, really fucking bad. This is a bad place to be. Yeah. And then right on cue, my emergency whistle goes off to tell me that I should already be out of the building and I've got fuck all air left. And I'm like, fuck. What do I do now? And again, training kicks in. And I went, it's fine. I've got an auxiliary hose. Leon's got an auxiliary connector on his set. I'll connect my hose into his set and we're going to have to come out attached to each other and I'll have to supplement his air. And I swear on my life, right on cue, I heard his whistle fucking go off from around the corner. <laughs> They're like double bubble now, aren't they? So you're, you're both like, like, yeah, right, who's got the air then? And, and I remember, I remember physically feeling, it's the only time in my, the second time in my life I physically felt my heart like physically sink. Yeah. And I just thought, I'm going to fucking die. Yeah. This is it. I'm going to die. And I thought, right, same thing again, fight or flight. What do you do? Do you sit there and feel sorry for yourself or do you try and make a difference? Do you try and change something? Yeah. So Leon at this point has shouted, um, I've, I've got the dry riser and, I, and I'd untangled the hose by this point. I'd done the last night. I put the branch on and I went, turn the water on. And I was thinking, please let there be fucking water. Because at this point, the burning is getting quite bad. And I'm like, I need to not be burning at yeah. this point. Turn the hose on. We got fucking water. First bit of good news in a, in a little while being in there. So we pulse sprayed the ceiling, cooled the gases down, took the temperature down to about 300 degrees, which is bearable at that point. We're both still dry. 300 degrees, fine. And we're now outside this guy's front door. And um, Leon's sidled up to me. And he sort of looked at me and we sort of, you have to wipe your mask at this point because you've got debris and shit all over the mask and it's greasy from the soot and you can yeah. sort of see like for a frosted window almost, just about make out your mate and you're talking like this, for, you know. Yeah. And I've, and, and he's looked at me and he's gone, what are we doing? And I knew what he meant with the question because I was already thinking it. And I went, I don't know. And I went, look, we're burning. You both we're thinking, can you get your man, aren't you? Yeah. We're burning and we're in fucking fire gear. We've got fuck all air left. You've got no air, I've got no air. He hasn't even got BA. We, we haven't got a smoker to, to put on him, which exists now and didn't back then. So now we've got like a little rebreather hood that you can put on it, elasticates around the neck and it filters the air as they breathe. You can get about, you know, 15. It's good for an evacuation so they can breathe. So what's going to happen with this guy is he's going to be unconscious within two seconds of us getting him out, if he's still alive, and then we've got to carry him down all of these stairs and we are going to run out of air. And then someone is going to have to come and fucking rescue us. Yeah, you're going to become the liability. And when you're they rescue be, yeah. us, they ain't going to take him, they're going to take us and he's going to be dead anyway. So we made the decision to leave the guy. That must have been hard. It was really fucking hard. And it it this was the start of a real bad spell in my life. Yeah. Um, you know, we left there, we got outside. I'm devastated that we've had to leave someone. I feel like a fucking failure. You start asking yourself unfair questions like, well, maybe if I trained harder, I would have been a bit fitter and my air wouldn't have run out as quickly. Yeah. You know, maybe, maybe I should have been more careful carrying the hose and the middle wouldn't have spilled out and we could have saved a few seconds there. Maybe this, maybe that. And, and you beat yourself up over it. Yeah. 
And I remember I was kneeling down on the grass. I'd come out. I was in a mess physically by the time I come out. I was exhausted. I was lightheaded. I felt like I was going to pass out. I was fucking, you know, murmuring my speech and slurring a little bit. And I was just completely, I'd pushed way <laughs> past my limits physically to have been in there and done what I did. And my colleague also. And um, I remember this paramedic came past and gave me a bucket of water to do some radio. You know, radio calling. You stick your wrists in a bucket, cool yourself down, bring yeah, my temperature yeah, down. Cool temperature That's down, it, yeah. yeah. So I'm doing that. And I remember looking up at Grenfell Tower and, and I remember it looked like a different fucking building from when I went in. It it got tw at, at least twice as bad. Could you feel the heat from the outside? I mean, it, yeah. it must have been like a, it must have been horrendous. Yeah, yeah. When I drove past it about eight days after it had happened, you could still smell it. Yeah, you know it, what is, I mean? it was horrendous, wasn't it? It, it just was, looked it horrendous. Was, it was bad. It's one of those things. I think your senses are dumbed down a little bit as a firefighter, especially when you've just been in there. When it's been five hundred and fifty, and you're outside, and you can feel the heat from the fire, you don't even notice it at that point yeah. because you know, it's significantly better than where you just were. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> but I, I remember looking up at a window and seeing this guy um, disappear into the smoke. He's at a window with a torch on his phone. And he and he and the smoke, the, the door must have failed behind him and this sort of glow of orange and he was silhouetted by the flame and then his thick black smoke billowed out and he just disappeared into it. And I remember being on my knees thinking, this fucking guy has just died. And then I thought, right, do you know what? I can sit out here on my knees feeling sorry for myself with me hands in a bucket of water trying to cool myself down and I can go and get another fucking BA cylinder, change the air cylinder in my BA set and get back in that fucking queue to go back in and try and make a difference because so far I haven't. And that's what me and Leon did. And we went in three times on the night in total and and played a part in, in rescuing some of the people that otherwise would definitely have died. what you've seen on the first trip in, I don't think anybody. I don't think there's. Any, I don't think there's anybody would have said fair one if you didn't want to go back in again. Do you know what I mean? But that that was that, that's extreme bravery to to go back in when you know. Do you know what I mean? You've just seen what's going on in there. You know the chances of, of coming back out again because you've 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 pushed them to the boundary yourself. Yeah. So that was an extremely brave thing to do. I think I think you'll understand when I say in them situations it, you're not really thinking about whether you're doing anything brave or whether you should be doing what you're doing, what yeah. you're thinking about is your job and that's it. And you don't think about more than that, really. Yeah. You just go, well, this is my job. This is what I signed up for. This is These, these moments are why I spent four years trying to get the job. Yeah. So if I'm going to work for four years to get the job and then not want to do it when I arrive, what's the fucking point in that? <laughs> do you know what I mean? This is so, did, yeah, did it is hard, did anybody? But... Did anybody sort of like go, well, that's enough for me tonight? Not a single person. That's, yeah, that's... Not that, a I mean, that, that is testament to the way that whole organisation cuts yeah. around and does its business, isn't it? Do you know what well, I mean? Well, one thing I will say about the... So and I'm going to say, because there, there was some honking remarks made on social media about all sorts of people after that, wasn't <laughs> yeah, there? Yeah, People who don't understand, and that's where I'm trying to go with this, because people who made any remarks against anybody who was there that night are wronger than wrongens, aren't they? Do you know what I mean? I, I, I think it's... I always try and think of reasons people say things that are hurtful or unkind, right? Yep. I always try and almost justify it on their behalf when I don't want to because You're I was... You're trying to get a positive from a negative. Yeah, exactly. Which is and, what I and, do. Yeah, and, and I was butt hurt at a lot of the comments, especially the ones where, that were made about race where they were saying, you know, bearing in mind the firefighter I was in there with is black. Yep. He's a Bayesian. And, and they're going, oh, the firefighters were making choices over who to rescue based on the colour of their skin. That really? was one of the things that was said. And I'm like... I understand when such a huge trauma has taken place and devastated an entire community. And you have to remember that some of the, some of the, when you look at the 72 names of the people that have died, some of them are the same surname after the same surname after the same surname. Yeah, that's, and yeah, that's yeah, across yeah, that's, generations. Yeah, yeah. That's three generations of a family been wiped out by this fire. I understand that people are fucking hurting. I understand that when people are hurting, they might say things that maybe a few years later they'll regret or not believe to be true. People lash out when they're hurting. And the way I look at that is I just go, do you know what? I know what I did. I know how I feel. And I know what I tried to do. If somebody else doesn't see that, that is a them problem. Yeah. That is yeah, not yeah, a me problem. Yeah, and I'm not yeah. going to let Because there was that one person that made me. a cardboard box. Did you see that one, did you? The cardboard uh, box for the, 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 the yeah, that was, fire and all that, that was for Yeah, um, that was for bonfire night, wasn't it? 5th of November yeah. 2017, they recreated Grenfell Tower and set it alight. and. Yeah. It was one of those things where the, um, I think there was, because there was a lot made in the press, and this is where the press are fuckers, they, there was a lot made in the press about the demographic of people that lived in Grenfell Tower yeah. being 
Um, and the words they used were illegal immigrants, migrants, foreigners, Muslims. You know, and that's that's what they were saying in 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 the national press. And the reality reality is, yes, there were a lot of of ethnically diverse communities living living in Ladbroke Grove. Yes, there were a lot of Muslims that lived in Grenfell Tower. And thank God, because it was Ramadan at the time, and a lot of them were up breaking fast. And if they hadn't been, a lot more would have died. Yeah. You know, there, there was talk about um, subletting and but illegal no, tenancy. You know, that, that, that's just story, because there were people in that flat. Do exactly. You know what I mean? And that's how I view it. There were people exactly, in that flat. Exactly, exactly, exactly that. And and it's it, it's just typical of this country where people like to, people like to try and, um, and I think the, they do it on purpose, they, they like a divided community. Mm. Division works well in this country for the people that need it to work well for them. If we're all busy fighting ourselves... No one's watching what else is going on around the corner. Do you know what I mean? And the reality is there isn't a single firefighter that attended Grenfell Tower that made any decision other than one to try and save somebody at great potential risk to their own lives. Mm. That is the only decision that was made at Grenfell by firefighters. What was the mood like in the station after you come back from a job like that? It was really weird. So we we got there at um, about quarter to one in the morning on the 14th of June and we went off duty at 4pm on the 14th of June um, and we were back on duty again at 8pm on the 14th of June. So we literally went off duty at 4pm after being there all night and all day, went to a pub, had a, a meal and a, and a Diet Coke each. Some of our girlfriends or family members came to meet us at this pub on Clapham Common called The Windmill. And before we knew it, it's like, we've got to go back to work. So we said goodbye to everyone, jumped on a bus and went back to our fire station. And, you know, four hours after leaving the most traumatic fire we've ever been to, we're back in the fire station doing your normal everyday things, testing your BA set, testing the fire engine, doing this, doing that. And it was a really surreal evening. And that night, I remember we had a couple of, couple of fires, uh, a couple of shouts, sorry. And one of them was a flat fire. And I remember, I remember the sick feeling that washed over me mm. when we saw, oh, it's a, it's a um, tower block, fire in the tower block. And I was like, oh, fuck me, high rise. I don't want to go. Please, no, not tonight. And you get on the truck and you turn up there and it's nothing. And you're like, yeah, thank toaster. fuck. <laughs> thank, yeah, it's nothing. And you're like, thank fuck for that. And then that was it. And then you go off duty. But unfortunately for me, I was... I was part of um, an urban search and rescue team, specialist rescue team um, that worked out of Battersea Fire Station. And that meant that on my second day off... Um, You're going still... back in the tower, are you? Yeah. My pager goes off. Can you come back and help the police DVI teams with body recovery? Oof. So I've gone back in under my USAR umbrella and, and gone back into the tower and seen every single body on every single floor, staring every single failure in the face including my one. And that snapped me. That was it. I don't think you can call it failures. It, 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 when I say it like so that, you're, you're, how, it, how it feels. Yeah, how it, yeah, but our our job's so to I, save I don't life. Want you to feel, yeah, yeah I no, no. I've made as much peace with all of that as I, as I can now. Yeah. I'm, I'm fine with all that stuff now. I understand that we worked hard and we, and we did our best, but what, I'm, what it meant was in that moment when I'm there, yeah. It feels like a failure. Wow. You're I mean, looking. That, that, it, was everybody there people that had been there during the fire? Um, no, not everybody. Um, not everybody. And again, we were given the option of not going. And I'll be honest with you, if I could turn a clock back and not go to that part, I would. It didn't help me. It didn't do me any no, favours at, uh, at, at all. Especially you know. like you say, you went back onto the 15th floor where, yeah. you, where you'd struggled and had to make a horrific decision. And now yeah. you're going to go and have to... Yeah, See it was the aftermath. Of that it was decision. it was brutal, um, and that started. Um, that was the start of my forthcoming diagnosis of PTSD, depression, battle with drugs and alcohol. Um, so break, you, you did you sort of like go so straight to the bottle after that? Just or was I it? pretty much just fell apart, mate. To be honest, like I remember it's about a week after the about. A week, it's a really weird double, sort of double life started. I. I've always written poetry as a kid, um, one reason or another. This is what I've done. And um, I remember I was sitting on my couch about, it was probably about two weeks, to be fair, after the fire, and I'm sitting there in my pants, drinking Stella, 
shit faced. I was properly smashed. Staring at my fireplace, crying. I'm in a bad place already two weeks after the fire. And these words, as I do sometimes, just some words came to me. So I just started writing them down. And within a couple of minutes, I'd written a poem about how it felt uh, as a firefighter at Grenfell Tower. And, you know, something I didn't realise until a couple of years later, really weirdly, the way I set the poem out, and this was completely unintentional, there's 24 floors at Grenfell Tower, and that poem was 24 lines long. And that was complete coincidence. Complete coincidence. And so I wrote this poem, and I stuck it out online, um, because someone, one of my colleagues at work said, that's really good, Rick, post it, it might help people. So I did. And then this fucking movie director (laughs) contacted me out of the blue on Twitter. And he said, I really like this poem. I want to make it into a short film. And I thought, pervert. I'll be honest. I thought, thought, fucking what a weirdo. And I was angry as well, a little bit. Do you know what I'm like? This is not a fucking thing to be trying to get your end away. Do you know what I mean? Right? That's taking a fucking piss. But I I messaged him back. And anyway, we, we, we. We spoke and, and he, we met up for a coffee and he was legit and he wanted to make this into a short film. And so we made this poem into a short film and, and that was nominated for an award at the Manchester International Film Festival. So we went up there to do that. And then um, I was invited on to BBC Breakfast to an interview about mental health on BBC Breakfast. And then this morning and then Man United TV. I'm a Man United fan for my sins. And so to go to my boyhood club. Of course you are. You come from London. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I'm almost sorry. Do you yeah, know what I mean? Yeah. And um, yeah, you know, so all these amazing things were happening, but behind the scenes, I was fucking falling apart. Yeah. I was taking cocaine all the time. I was drinking heavily. Um, I'd become really bad tempered with my. With so you've got my two fronts now. You've got, completely. You, you've got your front, which is cutting around doing stuff, but underneath you're, you're proper, you're, you're, you're in bits. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, it's, it's, and I always make a point of bringing this, this part up when I do these interviews because it's really, really important. I became aggressive towards my son. I I lost my ability to control my temper. And so whilst I stopped short of anything too bad, he was petrified of me. I would shout at him. Do you think there's a little him. bit of that come back from your stepdad <laughs> in you? Do you think some of your stepdad manifested in you? I, I, I don't know is the honest answer. Psychologically, possibly. Yeah. But I tell you what it did do. It, it helped me understand my stepdad a little bit more. Yeah. which was a confronting thing in itself because then a little bit of forgiveness crept in and that's confronting. You know, I didn't want to forgive him. He's an arsehole. But yeah. I can be like, well, I can understand why you're seeing your British transport police. You're seeing people chopped up under tubes and smashed and yeah, all the jumpers, all, all that of that sort of shit yeah, that yeah, you're yeah, seeing yeah, yeah. that I'd never known about as a kid. Now that I've had my thing that I'm going through, I understand how you can become short tempered and, you know, yeah. I mean, I smacked my kid so hard once because he wouldn't eat his dinner. I smacked him so hard on the ass that he pissed himself. That's brutal. Yeah, that is. Yeah. And it's taken a long time for me to rebuild a relationship with him. You know, he, he didn't want to come and see me. And that could, you know, upsetting your kids can be as, as hard as upsetting yourself. Harder than upsetting harder, yourself. Harder, harder. That, that's one thing I will, and people tell me I have to and I'll find a way and blah, blah, blah. But that that's one thing I will never forgive myself for. Yeah. I really, I just won't. I refuse to. I don't deserve forgiveness for that, in my opinion. I know I had stuff going on. I know mentally I was in a bad place. But what I had become was the one person I hated most in the world, which was my stepdad. Yeah. And that's fucking shameful. And and it wasn't, that was the an isolated incident when it comes to physical violence. But when it comes to screaming and shouting at him and grabbing him by the arms and screaming in his face, all this shit my stepdad did, I was doing. And I was doing it to his mum as well. You know, I, I once ripped a, a, a plumbed in hose off the wall outside in the back garden and, and burst the water, the, the, yeah, the water pipe. Because she'd put a, a fork and a dishwasher to, in the wrong bit. Really? So I mean, it's that serious. I'm stuff, far gone, that, mate. Yeah, Do you know is, what I mean? Yeah, I'm, yeah, I've yeah, lost. Yeah. I've got. Did she know there was problems, or did, or, or is people just going, "No, he's been an arsehole." It's really difficult. Um, and again, she was kind of in a position my mum was in. Only she made the right choice. She's in a position where she's going, "Well, this man needs my support, and I love him. My son is scared of this man. Mm. Who do who, who do I protect?" You pick your son. Yeah. Yeah. 100% of the yeah. time. Yeah. So it very quickly turned into a scenario where, and also to add into that, you have to remember, I've never had a mental health problem before at this point. She has never experienced one herself or had anyone in her life that has. Yeah. So neither of us know what the fuck's going on. 
as far as she's concerned, I went to a job one day, one person, came back the next day a different person, and that different person's a fucking arsehole. Yeah. And that's how it was, you know, that, and that's all it was. And, and she boiled it down that way because she didn't have the tools in her locker to be able to process what was going on with me and, and to help me heal. And I wasn't willing to try anything because I didn't know anything was wrong. Because as far as I was concerned, in my head, I was justified in my anger. Well, of course I'm fucking angry. Put the fork in a dishwasher, <laughs> do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm like, well, it makes sense. Why would yeah, I not yeah, be yeah. pissed off at this, yeah, you know? Yeah, 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 got you. And things just spiralled, you know? I, I had to move out. Um, my son didn't want to come visit me. I had to leave London and move to Kent. I've suddenly become isolated from everyone that I know. Getting to work's harder. I've now got financial problems because I've stopped all of my part-time work, all my part-time jobs I'd, I used to do. Yeah. As a like, builder's labourer, confined space rescue technician. Just knocked it all on the head because I was depressed and had PTSD. So suddenly... Your whole it, life is impacted. It's now. just fucking falling apart. Yeah. Just falling apart. And on top of all of that, I've developed a cocaine habit. So, you know, so I'm, dough is going so in less whatever now. money I've yeah, got yeah, that yeah, I should yeah, be spending yeah. on fucking paying bills I ain't paid, I'm, I'm spunking up the wall on coke. And, and the only reason, my, my good friend Dino said to me, um, we were on holiday in August after the year of the fire, and he said to me, Rick, if you don't make some changes to your life, you're going to lose everything. You're going to lose your house, your son, and your job, and your missus. It, possibly your life as well. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Because it doesn't. Yeah, you know, I've never ever had anybody turn around to me and go, "Phil, my life was, my life was, my life was fucked until I was on drugs." Yeah, you know what yeah. I mean? you know what it was mean? so much better once I found yeah. the drugs. It never yeah. happens that way, does no, it? Never no, ever no, happens no. that way. And I, and I tell you what, another Im important point on that on that front is, just before my missus told me, <laughs> before my missus agreed with me that I should leave, because <laughs> yeah. it was her decision, but it was the right one. Yeah, she um. She was out at work one day, and, and I was having a real bad day. And this month was probably around November time of 2017, I guess. So this has all happened fairly quickly. Yeah. And I was sitting home on my own. No lights were on. It was really fucking dismal outside. I felt really, really low. And I got up to go and get a glass of water. Made it about halfway across my living room, and then just sort of like slumped down on the floor and sat like a child, cross-legged, on my, on my, in the middle of my um, living room floor, and just started crying. And I'm not joking when I say oh, I stayed there for about four hours. I just sat there. It's like the floodgates had opened and they weren't stopping. I was just crying and crying and crying. And I felt so unbearably sad. And I remember sitting there, and thank God it didn't lead to anything, but I remember genuinely sitting there and thinking, I'm not going to feel any better than this for the rest of my life. This is it now for me. Mm. This is how fucking awful I'm going to feel every day until the day I die. And then I thought, well, if this is all life is going to give to me now, if this is how sad I'm going to feel every day of my life, I'd rather not live so you, anymore. You, you, that thought went in your head and it was there, mate. Yeah, and I thought and and that that'll be it. One. Like, um, yeah. you know, I'm going to take my own life. I don't want to be alive if this is what life is going to feel like for the next fucking like, 30, 40 years. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And I guess I'm lucky that I had my son because that's the next thought to come in my head. The, yeah. next, the next image I had was him at my funeral in tears, like, you know, and I thought, I can't do that to him. And then I'm very lucky that I've got a dad and a mum that I'm very close to, although um, they get on now, but obviously separated. Um, and I phoned them, and both of them answered the phone. And both of them spent some time talking to me. And then, a rarity in this country, but I, I phoned, they both said, you need help. You've got to get some help, Rick. So I phoned my GP and the GP said, we've just had a cancellation. If you can get here in 15 minutes, you can have an appointment. And I live 10 minutes away. So I literally, still in floods of tears, chucked some clothes on and walked in, the, in a drizzle to the GP surgery, walked straight in, sat down, said about four words and burst into tears again. Managed to sort of get out that I was a firefighter at Grenfell. And at that point, she pretty much just threw some antidepressants at me and said, you've got PTSD quite clearly. Um, start taking these. Um, you need to get some counselling and, and sort of put me in a loop for the counselling. Now, again, I'm lucky. The fire brigade had a counselling and wellbeing department and I signed up to that. And so I'd started counselling shortly before this moment anyway. Um, and then I'd gone on to the antidepressants. And the combination of the two, the way I explained it to people was I felt like I was in a dark room with no lights, no doors, no windows. It's just fucking darkness. No way in, no way out. Don't even know how you got there. 
And then going for counselling was like someone cut a skylight into the roof and said, this is the way out, mate. And a bit of light's coming in now. And I can see a route out, but I can't reach the skylight. And then going on the antidepressants was like someone lowered in a footstool and said, this ain't going to get you out on its own. And that skylight ain't going to get you out on its own. But if you stand on this, you can reach that. Yeah. And then you can drag yourself out. And, and so that's what I did. You know, I, I started the antidepressants and I started counselling. And it was a journey that was filled with false dawns, false hope. But it was a real roller coaster. You know, you think you're doing fine next yeah, you minute. Think you're out the woods and then you're all burst of a sudden, into boom, tears and, you and you're back again. down yeah. the bottom. And yeah, yeah like it, it, it's a fucking brutal ride. But with the right people around you and, and, if you're, as a man particularly, if you're willing to show a bit of vulnerability and so I am struggling. You know, I used to, people used to ask me, how are you? And I'd say to them, what are you asking? Are you asking, how am I? Or are you saying hello? Yeah, yeah, There's two yeah, very yeah. different answers. Yeah, of course there is. Yeah. So what, yeah, are you, yeah, yeah. what are you asking? And I'd give yeah. people an early out because, you know, there's nothing worse than saying to someone, how are you? Cause you and you've got to be somewhere in two minutes and they go, oh, mate. Right, well, this is that. And you're like, oh, shit. <laughs> Shouldn't have asked this question. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what I mean? Um, so I used to give people an out. But, you know, people were very kind to me. I've got a, a lot of good people around me that gave me the support that I needed when I needed it. And thankfully, I've, I've managed to, um, you know, drag myself out of that wilderness. And So did the PTSD lead to you having to leave the force? Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. At what Undoubt point did you have that conversation with someone in the force who went, I'll tell you what, mate. Enough's enough for you. I, I, I tell you the problem I had, all of this, and again, this is all, all happening at the same time. I started talking about mental health quite a lot because the more I did, the more people would reach out to me. I started getting messages on my social media from firefighters from all over the world. Yeah. And then paramedics and then police officers and then ex-military personnel and then ex-military personnel's wives messaging me saying, I've just watched this. I've shown it to my husband. He wanted me to say thanks. You know, real important messages, and I'm going shit. Stuff that I'm saying is and doing is resonating. Is, with is resonating. It's making I, I mean, a you, difference. The stuff that you were saying there about the, the the dark room with the light in the tunnel, and you know, making small steps, baby steps, getting all yeah. that's huge. That's powerful stuff. Yeah, yeah, proper powerful stuff. And and so it started making a difference. So the more it started making a difference, the more I I did it, and the bigger my social media grew. And with that, then people want more content and expect more things. So I started going on podcasts and doing interviews. And then one day I turned up to work and um, there was a letter waiting for me. And it said, you're now under the disciplinary procedures with the London Fire Brigade for um, failure to comply with their social media policy, um, failure to comply um, to drugs and alcohol policy, because they'd heard me say in a pod podcast that I'd been using cocaine. Oh, yeah. Um, and um, I went on SAS Who Dares Wins um, and they told me I couldn't do it, and I went and did it anyway. Um, right, okay, so... Because I wanted to. And and so basically, the, the last few years of my career, the post-Grenfell, 17, 18, and 19, were spent battling drugs, alcohol, depression, PTSD, and trying to heal. 20, 21, and 22 were spent trying to help other people do the same whilst fighting for my job against my employer. And I got to a point where I'm like, why am I here? Because they've got mental health department. Yeah. They've got mental health first aiders. They've got trim so they officers. they've offered you the they've... with one hand and slapped you with the other, basically, yeah. haven't they? And, and, and when I've become someone that they could actually utilise with a social media following yeah. that's, that's been in the national press talking very positively about their employer, Yeah. why the fuck would you not jump on that and go, yeah, yeah, let's yeah, use yeah, him? Yeah. There's, there is this is old, great. There's an old school mentality, I think, with some of these organisations that don't understand what they've got. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. The SAS who dares wins, I've got to talk to you about that. Yeah, of course, yeah. Why did you decide to go on that? Was that part of your sort of like, I want to do something, I want to cheat, I want to, you know, I want to go and... Right, I'm I'm going to be really, really honest with you about all this. Yeah. Because it would be easier not to, right? But I'm going to be really honest. I always looked at it and I went, with in my role as, as a firefighter, with my specific role, I do abseiling all the time. I'm good with rope work. Yeah. I was boxing for the fire brigade. I'm fit. I'm like, I can fucking do this. Because let's face it, you've done selection. Yeah. SAS Who Dares Wins is not selection. No, I know that. Do you know, I, I do you know what I mean? Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. it's, it's, for most of it is basic military training 
with a, a, a few little snippets of something different. Yeah, there's like, some like the interrogation and, yeah, and they, you know, they... things like that, right? All of that stuff, I didn't know how I would fare in interrogation, granted. But all of the other stuff, the bo- the fighting, the falling backwards off platforms, abseiling. Yeah, 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 yeah. Fucking which, walk- which, which show did you do? What, what... Season six. Oh, wow. Okay. So Billy and Foxy and... Uh, Was Ant's Ant, Ant, Ant's last one, yeah. Was Ant's, Ant's, last, one, Ant's okay. last one, yeah, yeah. And um, he really didn't like me. I, I really got the impression he fucking didn't like me. But anyway. <laughs> Call him um, out. Call yeah, him yeah, out, yeah, right, let's have it, Ant. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so, you know, I looked at it and I was like, I can do that. All of that stuff's my bread and butter. Yeah. It's it's the the mental side of it yeah. that I want to see where I'm at. And it's a big platform. And I want to get in the interrogation room and I want to tell... A, a briefer version of my story and I, and I want to talk about PTSD and I want to show people that there's a recovery because here I am. Yeah. You know, three years after Grenfell, here I am doing SES Who Dares Win. Did that, because I, 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 I didn't watch that series. Yeah. I haven't watched a lot of it at all, to be honest, but did, did they grill you for being a fireman? Did they find out about the Grenfell thing and then give you a proper grilling? Yeah, they did. Well, they, they gave him my mirror room interview, but it wasn't as, um, it's a TV show, right? Yeah. So people ask me what, what the DS like off camera. There is no off camera. But it is still a TV show. Yeah. And there is some direction in the TV show. Um, and Ant's come out recently spoke, speaking about Holly, who was the transgender girl that was on my okay. episode. Yeah. Um, she failed the fir- one of the very first tasks. And so she's off the course. Um, but the production team decided that because she was transgender and they wanted to keep that diversity in the program, that Ant had to let her come back in. Now, I know Holly. She's absolutely lovely. I would yeah. never want anyone to be kicked out. But I can also understand Ant's perspective on, well, this ain't how the fucking selection That's works. That's not how selection works. That's not yeah, how, yeah, so yeah, so are, now it's like, no longer selection. It's a... I don't care who you are, what you are, what yeah. your beliefs are. There's a bar to be met, and if you don't meet the bar, then I'm afraid you you're, you're that side of it. Do exactly. You know I mean? and, is, yeah, that's right. I get that. And and so from that perspective, it's a really fair point from Ant. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And and I think that ruffled feathers, and ultimately he's come out now and said that's why he then left the show at the end of that season because he was like, it isn't what it's supposed to be anymore. It's now it's about um, ratings and not helping the. the I think the recruits any show and... will have its ratings thing. I mean, I, I I do like what Billy and Foxy do with it. Do you know what I mean? I think it, it's they 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 you know they. Yeah. I've spoken to Billy about it before, and Billy's the first one to say this is not selection field. You know what I mean? This is a television program, but we are trying to highlight some of the areas where you know we can showcase the skills that we've got, and we can see if people can meet the bar. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. And then outside of that, all the rest of it's just normal TV politics. You know what I mean? Exactly. You know what I mean? And I'm not there, so I don't know. But yeah, but no, you're 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 absolutely right. So, so what basically happened with me is I I started to fill out the application form, and again, this was only. 17, 18, this is 2019, I'm filling out the application form. So I'm I'm still not in a brilliant place. Um, I'd sat up after night watching the previous season. So I'm all gassed up and I'm like, <laughs> yes, I'm going to do this. Started filling out the application form and very quickly I realised that everything was going to be about Grenfell. Yeah. All the questions in the application yeah. thing is like, what's the, the most traumatic thing you've ever done? Blah, 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 blah. And, I, and something in me just went, oh, do you know what? This doesn't sit right with me now. Because I, I don't want to go on there and exploit something. Yeah, I don't want to be the Grenfell the, man. Yeah, do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, 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 so yeah. I got yeah, halfway through, and then for other reasons, yeah. yeah, exactly. So I got halfway through the application, and then just sacked it off. What I didn't know is it auto saves, so they've now got half of my application form, and then so then I started getting phone calls. They've someone from production's obviously seen it and gone, "We need to get this guy on a show." So yeah. they've started phoning me up. Uh, no, emailing, sorry. Oh, you haven't. You need to complete your application. And I was like, I just thought it was an automated email. So I just ignored it and ignored the next one. And then another one come through from somebody this time saying, we've been trying to get in touch with you. Please, can you call us? So I was like, you know, I'll give him a call. So I gave him a call and then um, had a chat with one of the casting people for about an hour and a half. And at the end of it, he's gone to me, well, I'm pleased to say you've passed the, uh, the interview phase. And I was like, what? <laughs> I thought we were just talking. I didn't realise. <laughs> oh, right. Um, and, and at that point, I was like, well, fuck it. I'm in it now. Do you know what I mean? Um, so then we had the physical test. You had to do the run. And, and it was during COVID. So it was all done remotely, not in a studio. So you had okay. to film yourself, um, you know, mile and a half in, in nine and a half minutes or something it was. And done it this time. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> I like, fucking hell, look at him go. He's done it in 12 seconds. <laughs> so I did all of that, got on a show. Um, 
And I'll, I'll be honest with you, and this is, this is the part I'm going to be honest about, because I don't want to gas myself up. I was really open for somewhere warm. The year after me was Jordan. Yeah. Now, it's not often I'd sit here and say, I want to be in Jordan. But on that occasion, I would have loved somewhere dusty and hot. That's my environment. Yeah. I got fucking Scotland. <laughs> <laughs> All right? I got Scotland. And I'll be honest, I weren't happy about it. You know, we were up there on the Isle of Skye. Um, beautiful, by the way. Oh, wow. Beautiful. Up yeah, not, yeah. Not yeah, of course yeah, 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 it's lovely. So we're doing it up up there um, on Rasse, you know, and very quickly I got there and I struggled instantly with um, the way you get shouted at. Now, I wasn't prepared for this because I knew in my head, yeah, well, of course they're going to shout at you. That's the fucking point. They're going to shout at you. I don't know what it was, whether it is because of my stepdad or, or, or what it was that was going on with me. But when someone's in my face shouting at me, going, you're fucking useless, you know, C and blah, 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 and all yeah, this yeah, stuff, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm looking going, I'll fucking save people's lives. <laughs> <laughs> I ain't useless. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And my natural default setting is to go, who the fuck are you talking to? <laughs> a special forces operative of 20 years. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah, wind yeah, your yeah. neck in, Rick. Like, fair <laughs> enough. So I'm, I was struggling a little bit with this, right? And then I thought, it's all right, though, because I want to demonstrate how well I'm doing now. And that's going to be the hope that I can give to other people. You know, yeah. I can push myself and show that you can be suicidal in September 2017. And, you've come out. and you can come out of SAS Who Dares Wins in, in September 2019, three yeah. years later, you know, or 2020, whatever it was. What a story. Brilliant. And I realized very quickly that doing the events, like we had one abseil off the bottom of a um, oil rig. Yep. And and the time they set you was 15 seconds. The longest time a recruit took was 50, and I did mine in five. So you just literally... Pretty much just... It's what I do <laughs> every day. Do you know what I mean? Else. Yeah, do you know what I mean? Like, just... You know, I remember I remember on, on the show, like, as I eat the water, foxes in a row, and he's like, fuck it, hell. You know, because <laughs> I eat it like a sack of shit. <laughs> I knew I was capable of doing those, those things and doing them well. Yeah. What I wasn't willing to do is stand there in a pissing down rain soaked wet through with wet kit in the fucking drying room that don't dry anything and me dry kit that's now wet because Ant's just dunked this in a trough full of water for getting the wrong kit on and I'm standing there in a the yard shivering and I'm thinking the fuck am I here for? <laughs> yeah, like yeah. why am I here? Because I'd, I'd had a chance to talk about stuff in, in front of the camera in the car and I thought well it is a show so if production want to use that they want to get that message out they know that's why I'm here so they can use that. I don't need to stay for an, in, in, you know, an interview in the in the um, investigation room, you know, in the, in the mirror room now. Yeah. I, I can just fucking bail at, at any minute. And it was one of those moments where they, the DS, are gonna beast everyone until someone fucks off. And I thought, well, let me add this up. <laughs> I'm cold, I'm wet, and I'm unhappy. Yeah. I've had a chance to tell me story. Someone's got to go. <laughs> John staff and and, I, yeah. and I'll be honest with you I, I regret it and I do and this is where I'm going to be honest I really regret it um, I wish I'd done it a year later because mentally I'd have been in a better place well you would have been Jordan for a start well, I would have been in Jordan <laughs> to start with yeah, yeah. but I would even if it was in Scotland I would have yeah. been in a better place mentally yeah. and I would have been able to put in a better account of myself because you were saying and, that you know, little things were annoying yeah? little things were making you sort of like in your personal life and here you are now. Who cares if it's Billy Ant or Foxy screaming at you like yeah. that? But yeah, I'm I'm ready to go. Do yeah, you know I'll what have I mean? some of that. Yeah. But equally, I was fragile. You know, like when yeah after I'd after I'd left the show, obviously had a little bit of a panic, and they they wanted the better content. So I'm I'm in I'm in the the dorm area, um, sort of you know thinking, thank fuck, this is over. Like I've not enjoyed it. Yeah. Next thing you know, Ant's in the yard, and he's like, number one. And my heart, again, when I said earlier, there's only two times my heart's ever sank. <laughs> this is the second time. Because I've gone, they can't make me stay, can they? Like, <laughs> surely. That surely they, that what can they, can't, they can't make me, can they? And he's he's calling me. And so I'm like trying to get me fucking clothes on. I've run across the yard like a sack of shit. Boots are undone. Fucking T-shirts flapping about. And, he, and they've taken me in for a mirror room interview. And I'm thinking, what the fuck's going on? I've left. And it's because the show wanted the... That moment, you know, they wanted and, yeah, and they, they, wanted the re they wanted the reveal and all yeah, that sort of exactly. stuff. Yeah, exactly. And, the, and the they, they've edited it in and they built it into the show a, a different way. But it was nice in the sense that I got a chance 
to sit there in front of Foxy um, and Mel. And both those guys. Oh, are, was Mel on there? Mel, yeah. Mel's a great guy. Mate, well, what I lovely. I'll still, I still talk to Mel. Man I've ever come across Mate, Mel. it's ridiculous. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. to be fair to Foxy as well, he was the same. Like, on, um, I don't Dave, know Foxy as well. Billy I served with and Mel yeah, I served with. Nice. Fo- Foxy was, um, we're going up the mountain on, on day one. And, you know, I've got quite big legs, but I live in London. We haven't got anything that's more than that much of an incline. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Whereas people who live live up north and that, they're up and down the hills all the time. And yeah. my legs weren't used to, you know, with my foot at that angle, my calf at that angle, my foot weren't used to that. So all these different muscles are hurting. And I'm like, what the fuck's going on? My legs have stopped working. Anyway, Foxy has come past and gone, looked at me, up and down, carried on, gone past me, come back down again, looked at me again, gone up again. And I'm like, he's taking a piss and he's fucking running up and down the side and I'm struggling. <laughs> And then he's looked at me, he goes, number one, what the fuck's wrong with your legs? And I was like, I don't know, staff, they just stopped working. <laughs> and he just sort of shook his head and walked off again. And I was like, oh. It's when you realise how, how tough you guys are to, to, to be able to just have that mindset where you keep going no matter what. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's so commendable. And, and I guess deep down there was a part of me that really wanted the respect of the DS on that show. And and the the brutal truth is I didn't do enough to to warrant getting any. Do you know what I mean? Just turning up and saying I'm a bit sad and a bit broken, so feel sorry for me. I'm in the wrong place. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. You ain't gonna get that off the off the DS. And even you know with Foxy, he I know that from his backstory, I know that he can associate with my story. Yeah. Um, but equally, he's cracked on. Do you know what I mean? He's cracked on, and I was moping. I was feeling sorry for myself, feeling sorry for myself from my childhood, feeling sorry for myself with, the, you know, everything else that's gone on with my older brother being a bully, me, me dad not being the best at different times, although he's uh, um, amazing now. Do you know what I mean? Would you go back on the show? Um, I would, yeah. Well, Billy, you listen. <laughs> yeah. Get him back on, right? Yeah. Get him uh, back on. Oh. I, I, I want to see this man <laughs> with another chance, all right? You get retreads on Selection for Real, let's have a retread <laughs> on the show, all right? Channel 4, sort Ugh. yourselves out and let's give this man it. another go, all right? Let's do it. Because I would love to see that. I yeah. Think, uh, and, and actually, it's Selection for Real, guys come off it for a number of different reasons, do you yeah. know what I mean? And they get another go, so Channel 4. There we go. It, right? Get I mean, me on. Right? Because <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I, think, I, think, I think with the mindset you've got and with what you're trying to do, I think you, you probably, I mean, you'd give it a fair old bash if you went back on there. Yeah, the the only thing that I really struggle with, I don't have any fears to start with. Um, so that stands in good stead straight away. You know, you, you know, some people were like the backwards platform dive thing. I yeah. just, you, I'm not, I'm not taking a piss when I say this, and I'm not trying to belittle anyone that struggles with it. For me, it's falling over. Yeah, that's what you're falling you, over. You ain't, you ain't got a problem with heights, have you? Yeah, no. All that's, day long, that's ladders, what I mean. shaking, you know, all that yeah, sort of stuff. You're, that, you're falling yeah, 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 and, yeah, yeah, and I'm yeah. good at taking instruction. So if someone goes, "This is how you do this." That's the way I do it. Yeah. I don't understand people where they get shown this is how you do it. They get on that bit of apparatus and then they don't do it that way. I'm like, have you, did you not just see how they showed you to do it? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So that side of things, I'll be fine. The only thing I, I really struggle with is, um, is being fucking cold. <laughs> Honestly, I hate it. Honest about it. I hate it. I despise it. <laughs> if I've got a wet t-shirt that's cold and it's flapping against my skin, I want to tear someone's head off. <laughs> it's the most sickening, <laughs> disgusting, horrible feeling. And oh. I appreciate how pathetic that sounds, because it does, and I know it is. But you know what you said about spilling the milk? Yeah. Earlier, yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's, so what, it's what, what's, your, what's your plans for the future? What, what, is, what is you in the future, apart from going back on SAS who did So, wins? well, apart from that, um, so I started up my own, <laughs> um, my own motivational speaking company okay. a few years back. Um, so I do a lot of talks at the moment. I go into prisons quite a lot. Um, for a company called 101st Foundation. Okay. Yeah, that's headed up by a guy called Will, um, who is a former Saracens professional rugby player. Okay. He um, he set up this foundation where, through rugby, they'll try and help um, rehabilitate prisoners. Mm. So they have to meet certain criteria, and they have to adhere to that criteria whilst on the course, and they get speakers in to um, try and keep them on track and, and, and deliver them a bit of motivation. So they'll get me in to do that. Um, I'm helping with a charity at the moment called the Gratitude Games, which we have been fighting to get up and running probably for about three years now. We've got all of the infrastructure in place. We've got all of the um, right people on board. 
as always, the thing that we're struggling with is the money we need to initially put on the first games. The idea of this, he'll hate me describing it this way, but it's the easiest way. It's the Invictus games, but it's for mental health um, okay. injuries yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it's one. for emergency service workers and their families. So the first games will be um, across two cities. It will be um, 20 um, different competitions, 20 different events, um, 20,000 competitors over a whole month. And we've already got um, Manchester, Salford, Birmingham um, cities competing to yep. host the games. Um, and and that's taken up a bit of time. Yeah, we've been to Parliament with it. We've been all over the place. So for anyone listening, look up the Gratitude Games. Give the page a follow and a like. Well, we certainly will. We'll, we'll follow and like yeah. you as a station and as a as a platform. That would be amazing we'll, if we'll you could because it's, it's yeah, vitally important, you know, to, yeah. to give people a... It's just like the Invictus Games. To, to give someone... People like me who have, who have really struggled at times to be able to step out in an arena, take part in a race and win or lose be cheered on by a yeah. stadium full of people that appreciate you for doing the job that you've done can make a huge fucking difference to someone's yeah, it life. It massively does, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and, yeah I and totally get it. The, the first games we need money, we need funding for. The idea of it and the reason we're putting it on is under the, the um, parent charity UK Emergency Services Giving, the idea is that through existing charities, we're going to set up a bespoke mental health service. So the money raised by the first games will be enough to put the next one on and so on and so forth. Yeah. And also a surplus of money will be left over so that when an emergency service worker in the UK is struggling, they don't have to wait on an NHS waiting lists. They don't have to rely on a limited service offered by their particular fire service or police force. Can they can get, come straight to us straight and they can go, I'm feeling suicidal and we can go, don't worry, here's what you need. Here we go. And we yeah, can well, give no, it no, to no, I really hope that happens and I really hope, look, we'll, we'll, we'll support you as a channel. For Thank 100% you. 100% on that. I mean that as well. Um, listen, it's been great. It's been amazing talking to you. Yes, likewise. I hope you'll come on again at some stage, and I hope you get this stuff off the ground because that would be that would be phenomenal. Thank I'd you. I'd also want to see you on <laughs> yeah. Who wins in Listen, a I'm not taking all a right. piss. I'm happy to go on it. So good. All right, speak to your mates. Right, yeah, I will. I definitely will. All right, look, thanks for coming. Nice one. Right, thanks nice very one, much, buddy. mate. All Cheers. Right.